Edfu Foundation Incorporated utilizes science and the teachings of our ancestors to improve humanity. We want to reunite and uplift our family throughout the planet. Our message or theme for 2021 is Original People United. We work hand in hand with our sister organization, the Conservancy Corp, investing in the future of humanity through our programs and advocacy. We seek to move our civilization from its current state to that of a type one civilization on the Carter Jeff civilization scale and beyond in a spiritually holistic way. We stand by the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Durban Declaration and Program of Action and support United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals and Environment Justice. Support Eiffel Foundation by checking out our page and subscribing. Welcome to Afronauts. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us uh, for our show today. Uh, today we are celebrating Black History Month. Today, uh, this year's theme for Black History Month is the Black family, representation, diversity, and identity. And we have some wonderful guests that uh, really embody those uh, values. Uh, we have Dr. Anthony Browder, an archeologist extraordinaire, and uh, the only Black man to hold, uh, have their own dig site in ancient, oh, sorry, not ancient, in, in Africa, in Egypt. That's right, Egypt is in Africa. Um, and uh, we have, he's also the uh, author of The Browder Files, Egypt on the Potomac, and they've been doing 35 plus years of Egypt on the Potomac tours, yep. as well as he's done over 60 trips to Egypt. Um, and please go out, support his work, uh, look for this, you know, Google Dr. Anthony Browder. He's a wealth of information and we're really glad to have him on the show. So thank you for being here, Dr. Browder. And then uh, we also have Afua Richardson, uh, who is a Jane of all trades and illustrator. So you might know her work from uh, Marvel Comics, DC Comics, um, Lovecraft Country. Um, she's a musician um, and she has her own project. Uh, it's called Aquarius. Is that right, Afua? Yeah. That's great. That's right. Uh, Pre-orders not out yet though, right? Not just yet, but okay. it'll be coming soon. All right, and so we'll be looking forward to that as well. And so thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And uh, we have Dr. Dina Mahmoud. She is a board member of Edfu Foundation, and she is a, also a multi-talented person. She is the founder of Africa Week 2020, as uh, uh, the many other things, and which she'll tell you about a little later on. But let's get to it. Um, one of the reasons I had I, I, I asked uh, for Dr. Browder and a fool to be here is because, like I said, it's Black History Month, and uh, with the theme being Black family diversity, identity, and um, representation, I felt like these two people really, really um, spoke to me and spoke to that issue. Um, and I'll start with the fool, ladies first. Um, when it comes to representation, the work that you've done, uh, being a black female illustrator in a mostly male, white male dominated uh, workplace, how has that uh, affected you and how has that made you look at, you know, your, your role in society and in the industry? Well, you know, uh, my, my father is a polymath. He's a physicist. Uh, and a mathematician, a teacher, but he's also a sculptor and an oil painter. So he was the first person to really um, encourage me to exercise both hemispheres of my brain at the same time. Uh, that being said, uh, comics and comic books and um, science fiction and things like that were places and a, a, an industry that really allowed me to develop uh, an emotional maturity. You know, I, I faced a lot of different hardships and my father was sharing the stories of, of us and, and our family and the hardships that his mother faced as well as him living in Tuscaloosa, Alabama during, you know, the 50s and 60s. Oh, Not wow. so yeah. kind of place. <laughs> and so uh, I understood that I, I came from a family that faced some incredible, incredible times and incredibly horrible times, but they were still kind. They still, you know, pursued the sciences and the arts. And 
even if they were not welcome and uh, they felt like there was no place for them, they made a place. And um, the same with comic books, you know, the characters that I would read about from the X-Men and the mutants and the superheroes, they didn't do what was easy. You know, and uh, I, I resonated with that quite a bit. And so, you know, I, um, I don't think I got into comics thinking I'm going to be one of the few black women to do this. And when I started going to comic conventions, they were already there. Uh, there was Aletha Martinez, there was Sanford Green, there was Joyce Chen, uh, Amanda Palmer, and uh, Gail Simone. You know, they're the women and, and brown folks already already there. It was the psychological permission. You know, when when there were too many people who didn't look like me, it was like, oh, okay, well, maybe I don't belong here. Well, why not me? Why don't I start? And when I started speaking to the editors and people who were hiring, I thought, okay, well, nothing is stopping me but me. And so thankfully, uh, art is a place where my work can speak for me and not my appearance. So uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here and uh, give the psychological permission for other creatives to make their own way. I think that's really interesting because, um, you know, when I was doing my little bit of homework for the show before you came on, I saw something you said and you said, you don't get mad, you get creative. That's right. And, <laughs> and so like when you saw like spaces that you weren't in or you saw you weren't represented, you were like, I'm going I'm to sit there, I'm going to draw me, I'm going to do me. And I think that's, that's a spirit that's like very much needed in the world. And so I want to thank you for that, definitely, because I, I know I've enjoyed your drawing. Oh, thank you so much. And it's it's really basic things. A lot of creatives don't see art as a service. You know, they, they don't think about how often people engage with media from packaging to graphic design to the way that they occupy their space and their minds when they are not working. You know, and art takes up a lot of that time. And so providing a service, a space where people can relax and be somewhere else and feel something else and then come back to their situation, that's a service. And a lot of times, it, you know, beauty and strength and all of these attributes that these different characters represent, people didn't see themselves. There were things that I saw that were missing. Like um, I was a big fan of Jackie Joyner Kersey. Like before I got into the arts and, and music, I wanted to be a track star. I wanted to, <laughs> you know, like do high jump and long jump. And I, I looked at these athletes um, like superheroes. I, I thought, you know, Jackie Joyner, I thought Flojo was one of the Thundercats. And um, <laughs> I thought, okay, um, if Wonder Woman's going to be lifting up these cars, she's going to need bigger quads than that. So I got to work. And I was like, I wanted to do the things that made more sense. Like, okay, well, I see, you know, women who are all kinds of shades, all kinds of shapes, and they're beautiful. I just don't see them here in these books. Okay, well, I've got two hands and a pencil. I can draw. I don't need one really for that, but... Um, and I saw it as an opportunity, not as a slight, you know, especially if I was able to create what was missing. And if I couldn't, then I would support the people who did. Right. Excellent. So I want to give, I have other questions, but I want to give other people an opportunity to um, ask your question. So I'll shoot it to the rest of the panelists. If you got, if you all have a question you'd like to ask it, then please go ahead right now. Yeah, I got a question. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, how do you feel about? All right. Uh, you, you, you. I seen a few of your drawings. They, they, they're real nice. Real nice. Thank you kindly. How do you feel about? I'm an old school uh, comic guy. We, we talking way back with the, uh, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, how do you feel about Jack Kirby? To me, he was like one of the greatest comic, you know, artists ever. Just from his visions you know. visionary right. absolute visionary like people like to hate on the old stuff sometimes they they think like oh well it, i didn't see me it excluded this but think about it. there the things that existed before jack kirby you know the right. things that he drew from you know there wasn't he was 
he was pulling from his life experiences, the things that he was seeing, but he was innovating. Yes. You know, I think about Don McGregor and his contribution to Black Panther. Black Panther was just a dude who popped up, you know, when the Fantastic Four needed some new gear. He was a jungle king, just kind of a side <laughs> character that wasn't really considered. It was Don McGregor and his artist who went up to the Bronx and, you know, sat there for hours with no budget, you know, and Marvel not even really giving them a lot of support and saying, yeah, you know what? This is this is not a side character. This is someone who deserves a, a, a seat at the table, his own kingdom, his own guard. And he fleshed these things out and the 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 archetypes and the the characters that are here today you know from from Ditko to to Kirby these guys are the foundation and they deserve the respect people who know me know that my favorite superhero of the moment is Arinthia Blue and I wanted is? to ask you Arinthia Blue <gasps> yes and so my question to you is what is the likelihood that we can look forward to seeing some real Arinthia Blue comics? Well, um, uh, for those who don't know, uh, Arinthia Blue is a character in Lovecraft Country. Um, I was hired to illustrate for um, uh, Jada Harris, who is uh, D or Diana Freeman. And um, she made comic book about, comic books about her parents, uh, Arithia Blue and Panther Man. And um, it sort of became this self-fulfilling prophecy where her mother kind of you know, goes through this portal and rewrites herself as this character. And, and it was interesting when, uh, you know, this is the first film project that I've been a part of, you know, this closely and this intimately. And... Um, when that comic came out in the season finale, it was actually supposed to be a full, full page, like a fully realized comic. But um, we got kind of our, our dates mixed up and, and instead of, you know, the 27th, which I thought it was supposed to be, and, um, it, the, everything got moved up. So they're like, okay, well, we need this by tomorrow. I was like, I can't create 22 pages. <laughs> in 24 hours so i ended up making that cover in about three hours from scratch oh thank wow. you i was i was already up for 26 hours and i was like oh i'm seeing stars these are real things i'm seeing um but there was no time to fully actualize it and i was supposed to be written in the comic as the person who literally shows uh hippolyta how to draw so it's very meta but um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I know um, Misha Green, um, when asked about season two, you know, she had the book to work from the first time through. And now she would have to write a completely new manuscript. So that's going to take a little bit of time and with COVID and everything slowing things down. But I think it's something that she definitely wants to do. It's just going to take a little time for that to be in the oven. And uh, hopefully they'll have me be a part of that. Yeah, just as a follow-up, I wanted to say, I, you know, I've there's been a few times when Arinthia Blue prints have been available, just people conceptualizing the art, and they've sold out um, faster than I can become aware of them. And I, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's so wonderful. The auction, like, <laughs> oh, that's so great! I'm so glad that people like resonate with this character because that means that. Um, perhaps within them, they, they can see and understand their circumstances and say, okay, I have the power within my mind to rewrite myself. I can, you know, voyage outside of myself. And that's kind of what I, I one of the reasons I was so excited about being on this panel, um, especially with uh, Dr. Browder, um, thinking about Egypt and these different ancient sites. And a, a lot of these uh, layouts and rock formations and temples. I mean, besides being an archaeological marvel, um, 
just the sheer size and symmetry of these things and their alignment with, you know, different constellations or uh, some people theorize a, um, a stone textbook, like a, a comparison between uh, the human body and these different uh, sites that every every day every year there are just new things being dug up and, and we know more and more about ourselves uh just world history and the history of the world through observing these sites and so it's kind of like uh looking back to to move forward uh i think with the Rithia blue <laughs> which is of, what uh, uh <laughs> like afrofuturism kind of is right our ancient yes. future and you so Absolutely. aptly put it like um bring in uh, the whole concept of Egypt like yeah totally that was one of the reasons I really wanted like I was like please because like I have Dr. Browder coming on it just the whole thing between the the mythology of comics and the cosmology of our people in ancient yes. Egypt and um, I'll throw it over to Dr. Browder I know I've, I've had the opportunity to have you give a, a lecture uh, for some young students in my workplace and um you talk about the indinkra symbols and the connection that you made um even in ancient egypt and how you know pretty much and the wonderful thing you do with the timeline about how our people are pretty much all over the planet right and so could you speak to a little bit about like the cause i like to call it cosmology um because i work with a lot with indigenous people and they always say oh well our mythology is this our myth it's not mythology it's it's the story or origin story of your people in the cosmos right um mythology is something that's totally is like totally made up like comics is a mythology right so i like to call it cosmology yeah yeah exactly so dr Browder, could you explain to us you know our cosmology and the connection that we have with these stories and the visual griots like uh afu and the importance of their work and stuff well, look, uh, the cosmology has been mythologized. Myths are a way of, of transferring information down through the ages, through generations, such that it becomes timeless. So you take the, the basic symbolic elements, incorporate them in the myths, and those myths become larger than life. That's why the story of uh, Heru became the personification of every hero in every comic book written since the beginning of time. It's the retelling of the oldest story ever told. And that story has its roots in the cosmos. So when you really study comedic history, uh, it goes all the way back to Asara, Set, and Heru who were uh, mythologized in constellations. Uh, Asara, the myth of Asara was projected into the heavens as a constellation known as Sahu, which we know today as Orion, or the myth of a set was projected into the heavens or brought to earth from the heavens in the personification of uh, the star Sirius A. And the myth of Heru was brought to us from the cosmos in the person of, uh, in the presence of Sirius B. So within these three African personalities, you have the process of the means by which uh, human beings, brought knowledge from the heavens to create the first family, all right? The first family, the first documented civilization known to mankind. And when a member of that first family is murdered, then his wife creates the means by which he can be reincarnated uh, as his son. So this whole process of, of uh, a set searching for the missing parts of Asar's body, this story is a myth, but the myth speaks to the disappearance of the constellation of, of, of Sahu for 70 days before it reappears on the horizon. So it's a way of teaching physics. It's a way of teaching cosmology. It's a way of teaching history and culture and mythology um, in an African-centered context in Kemet. Uh, and so when that information is lost, Arabs who didn't come to Egypt until very late in the game, and because they've been miseducated, they would try to claim this history and culture as their own. But if you know your past, then you can check um, modern day Egyptians with knowledge of the past. So, you know, we're here as part of a continuous evolution. Uh, we're here to, to evolve and ultimately return back to a cosmic consciousness. And the means by which that cosmic consciousness is embedded in our DNA and our ancestral memory is through mythology. So the two go hand in hand. And our ancestors in Kemet, our ancestors in the Nile Valley. So let me not just um, focus solely on on Kemet, because if it wasn't for Dima's relatives in, in Kush and Nubia, there would have been no Kemet, right? If it was not for 
uh, our ancestors in Ethiopia and, and, and Kenya and Uganda and Tanzania, you know, there would not have been a, a, a Kemet in Egypt. So we have to look at the entire Nile Valley as one family and we have to do the research. We have to do the, 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 heavy, the heavy lifting uh, because we cannot leave it to our oppressors to tell us our story. That will never happen. And until we commit ourselves in sufficient numbers to dig up the myths and reinterpret them, and then to illustrate them so that future generations can understand that they are part of a continuum. You know, very simply, if you understand the fact that, that um, humanity began in Africa over 300,000 years ago, humanity began in Africa, this is a scientific fact. Humanity began, Homo sapiens sapiens lived in Africa and Africa alone for the first 250,000 years. That's, that's an accepted scientific fact. And it wasn't until approximately 60,000 years ago that a group of Africans walked out of Africa and populated Asia. It wasn't until about 40,000 years ago that another group of these same Africans walked west into Western Asia, the landmass that we now call Europe, and populated Europe. So it means that the first Asians were African, the first Europeans were African. Uh, and it was only within the last seven to 8,000 years that the Africans in Europe mutated, lost their melanin, and became the people that we now call Europeans. So we have the longest record of historical documentation of any people on the planet. We left visual illustrations from the beginning of time of, of who we were, what we've done, and what our, our understanding of, of the cosmos, our, our original home was. We've lost that knowledge, uh, or others have stolen or appropriated that knowledge, and now it's our job, it's our responsibility to tap into the memory of those 300,000 years of ancestral memories that we have, that we carry in our DNA and begin to reconstruct new myths for a new generation to carry them forward for the next seven generations, as you said, Sheldon, at the top of this conversation. That's where we are. And, and do you see that, like, you know, with the work of artists today, like Afua, Tanesi Coates, um, there's so many... Uh, Dr. Lawana Richmond, Mook Nito. Do you see like us remaking those myths, those sigils, those that cosmology, like drawn on our DNA, drawn from the ether to to move us forward from the past? Well, look, uh, I, I was I was fascinated listening to Afua talk about her family. Uh, her father is from Alabama. Uh, my mother, my grandparents are from Alabama, and they were part of that great migration to the north. Uh, into into Chicago, where where I was born, and then when I think in terms of, of the artistry, the the Black Arts Movement started in Chicago. Uh, I had aspirations. I've been drawing all of my life. I had aspirations of, of being an architect, of being influenced by the architecture of Chicago, being influenced by the Frank Lloyd Wright buildings that I walked past every day on my way to school in Oak Park, Illinois. So um, my aspirations for being an architect were cut short by my limited understanding of math. <laughs> and so when I transferred to Howard University in 71, I changed my major to design. So I've been drawing all of my life. And uh, I'm better known as uh, the, the writer of the Browder File, Now Valley Contributions to Civilization, Egypt on the Potomac. But what I tell people, I write like an artist. I see history through the eyes of an artist. And artists have this ability to transcend time and space. Artists have the ability to convert um, shapes, concepts, and ideas into symbols. Um, and so those symbols then become a means by which you, you, you draw pen and paper, or you, you create uh, beats, uh, you create poetry, you, you write uh, phenomenal narratives that have the ability to be absorbed into the consciousness of whoever hears it, sees it, or reads it, and then you begin to change their consciousness, consciousness on a cellular level. So that's what we have done better and longer than any other people on the planet. And despite all of the uh, restrictions that are imposed upon us by living in a, a racist society, we still are using our ingenuity in order to free our minds and express our realities and put information out there in the ethers which is transforming the consciousness of millions of people all around the world. That is who we are, that is our legacy. And we've done it longer and better than any other people on the planet.
I, I, I would definitely agree. I, I would say Deem and I actually had this conversation before because I'm, I'm a hip hop kid. Um, I grew up, that's my generation. And, you know, one of the things I'm always saying is like, you know, we're, we are creators as a, as, as a people, you know, that's what we do. We, we created a blues, we created jazz, we created, we create civilizations, we create culture, right? Um, and so I think that's something that's innate in us as a people that that's what we do. We draw from the ether, we draw from that well of spirituality. And I told Dima, like Dima, I had this little argument one day. I was like, one of the reasons we have so many issues is because sometimes we go to the well without doing any of the work. We expect to draw from that etheric well, like, oh, I'll spend all my money because I know I'll just pull it from the ether, right? <laughs> or, you know, I'll, I'll wait till, I won't study tonight. I'll wait till the morning to get ready. Cause I'll just, right? And I say, that's a big issue with, I think innately we do understand that uh, ourselves in that way that we, we you know, uh, we may not identify that spirituality in the same way, you know, some of us may be Muslim, Jesus, whatever you are, but somehow there's that innate sense in us that, you know, we can draw from that well. And I think that's one of our strengths, but it's also kind of um, a criticism to the way we act as well. What, what, what would you, like, what would you like, both like, say like, to that? Like, like, like Iverson said, practice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. What I need practice for. <laughs> well, I draw every single day because um, as a as a creative, I can't draw on an empty well. I have to take care of myself as well because you know I, I'm the vehicle for this uh, work to come through. But you know, um, practice. I, I say this often, practice does not make perfect. It's perfect practice that makes perfect. So you have to observe your technique, what it is that you're doing and where it is that you're weak. And I think that's something that people don't like to do because it is unfun to be bad at something. <laughs> and you do not like to lean on your weaknesses, but that just, uh, what does it say in the... Uh, the art of war strength is a matter of solidarity and weakness is a matter of having gaps so as a creative if your weakness is math well spend 10 minutes each day <laughs> doing something that is difficult and then you know you go back to what's easy and pat yourself on the back and be like i can do this thing well you know um but uh, as a creative it's uh, it, it's difficult there are things that i'm still learning there are things that are, are not my forte and not my strength but they are also the things that keep me from being a better artist so i'm trying to learn and push myself to learn and um you know really just humble myself and say okay you know what i need instruction in this area i know where i am here and uh, a lot of times um people will get in their own heads about things and say like well because i don't know everything that uh, i'm not an expert in any field you know honor what it is that you know and know what you don't know <laughs> and uh i'm i'm trying my best to to live by that but getting back to the the myths and mythos you know um i'll, I'll see different creatives through time calling on these different archetypes it, it always seems to see to be the same ratio the same proportions and the same interactions uh, just as dr browder said over and over again you see um the the icon of the just man unjustly persecuted the son of man the superman the neo the horus the witsulopachli the um Sun. the crow the sun the sun and then there's the trickster the mercury the person who's illuminated the person who has information the uh the coyote over and over again uh, the spider the you know it's it's all of these different operating systems these cultural cultural operating systems for natural phenomenon that stay with you because a story will or a song will stay with you longer than math might or language because these, these stories are the things that we hold on to, which is why perhaps people get so embroiled in these dramas, because these are old archetypes playing out you know, on us over and over again. But if there's information in it, 
than uh, those proportions and those relationships between the, you know, these heavenly bodies and this natural phenomenon will stay with you. Even if you don't necessarily recognize that Batman is just like Pluto. He's the guardian of the underworld. He stays in Gotham <laughs> and uh, he's keeping all of the bad guys at bay, just like Pluto, you know, sits around the, the, the Well, I always like to say Batman is Illuminati. Like he gets paid from all these people. He spins the Arkham, that's why he never kills anybody. And they always escape and do the same thing. And then he just puts them back in his private prison. And you know, but I guess he is also like the underworld too, but. <laughs> and that's the thing about it, is they're all multivalent symbols and that's right. what's so powerful about it. it. It's something that we can interpret and reinterpret. And um, you mentioned earlier the, the Adinkra symbols and that was something that when I started um, really looking into those, those are powerful. It's, it's like a philosophy embedded in a symbol. And when you look at it, it triggers something in your mind. Um, when you know the meaning and, and then that can live on past, you know, King Kofi who created them or beyond Ghana, beyond, you know, its origins, it can mean something to someone else and, and you know, resonate in them just like a, uh, a violin close to another violin. You, you strike a note and the note will sound in the other violin. It, it's kind of the same way. And that's why I put them in uh the black panther world of wakanda covers i didn't see any adinkra in all of the uh the black panther comics and i said okay well we've got a we have an african king okay we are putting in some african symbolism is that okay marvel You're, you guys cool with that they're like hey hey as long as like t'challa's on the cover we're fine i was like all right Oh, here's an opportunity to let people know um, uh, a little bit uh, about some of these philosophies. Like, uh, I think that's the importance of. Obed I think that's the importance of representation, though, right? Like, because just you just like the Black Panther's been out just before I was born, and um, you, you said like there's been no African symbolism. However, like all it took was a fool to get, or, you know, to be the artist. And she's like, oh, I'm going to correct this, right? Because no one else obviously saw that disconnection there. And so I think that's a beautiful thing. And I, I would definitely like to thank you for doing that, for sure. For oh, sure. I'm, I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to even do so. And, and I can understand, you know, people don't want to pull on something that they don't think is like from their culture. They don't want to disrespect the culture by like pulling on something that they they feel that they're not a part of. You know what I mean? Like if uh, people will throw around uh, Japanese symbols all the time and you don't want to be that one person to get the tattoo <laughs> with, of the wrong kanji. Right, right. <laughs> so it just looks like you're like, oh, I think you meant to say love, but that might say um, <laughs> so I understand, you know, the, to want to tread lightly <laughs> around these things. But um, my name of Fua is from Ghana. And uh, it's for a girl born on Friday, just like uh, Kofi. And uh, Kofi is a boy born on Friday. And um, if I'm if I if I've got this correct, uh, there was a king in the Akan who um, sort of tr not he didn't trespass, but he made what was called a king seat. Uh, there was a, a site in a neighboring nation where a meteorite landed and they created a throne based on that site and they, they, they had a name for it. And so he thought, okay, well, I'm a king, so I believe that I should have a king seat as well. But it was seen as disrespect and it started a war. And so to end the war, he surrendered himself and his life and in, uh, in his final... Um, his final will, I should say, was to embroider these symbols on a cape or a cloak, and Adinkra means goodbye. So it, they are symbols that have individual meanings uh, for a transition. So they used to be, you know, uh, regarded as something very, very um, 
transitionatory, <laughs> you know, for weddings, births, funerals, moments of great transition, but then they became a lot more common and used in clothing and things like that. So one of the symbols that I used for Black Panther was Nea Opis Se Obede Hene, he who wants to be king must first learn to serve. And I thought, wow, that's really specific. <laughs> And uh, incredibly accurate, but also anyone who wants to lead his people has to understand how they can be of service to them, you know, not just lord over them and tell them what to do. That, that's not what a, a, in my opinion, what a king should do. It's someone who, you know, understands and can um, have a, an eagle eye view of the needs of their people and understand how he can meet them. So I thought like, okay, I know this is fiction and I know this is uh, a, a fictional character, but I think this is a really great opportunity to bring some of the things that I think are be really, really beautiful about you know, my culture and where I come from uh, to this fictional narrative so that other people can know. Excellent. So Dr. Brada, like, uh, what would you say to one of the things that Fuwa said is like, you know, she was kind of hesitant or careful to when using the Adinkra symbols, uh, you know, as to not, I don't want to say culturally appro appropriate, but to, you know, kind of misuse that, those symbols. What would you say to like Black people in America that use Adinkra symbols or, you know, because there are a lot of Black people in America who, um, who really identify with Africa, right? That's where the Pan-African uh, movement, you have a lot of people who, you know, they're, they're all about their Pan-Africanism. So um, is it cultural appropriation when we do it, right? Because I've, I've, I've even seen the argument um, the other way as to, well, we have these movies and they have Africans playing African-Americans. What, what would you say to those types of issues? Not well, saying that a fool was saying that, I'm just... Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, KRS, a, a good buddy of mine, an artist friend of mine, as a matter of fact, the brother who, the artist who illustrated uh, my daughter's first book, also illustrated uh, my, 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 first, my, my first two books. Uh, he's the one that turned me on to, because I'm not of, I'm, uh, <clears throat> let me start a little controversy. I'm not of the hip hop generation. <laughs> I, uh, it's okay. I, my music was real. Uh, <laughs> Shots fired right there, Dr. Brown. Shots fired right there. <laughs> I mean, we respect Motown and, you know. You have to. Cause I, Motown, I, 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 get, I have to agree. <laughs> I gotta agree. I'm foundation. from the hip hop generation and I agree with Dr. Brown. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, my brother. And see, but this is my point. This is my point. We don't have to argue over who's right because we're part of a continu uh, continuation, a continuum that has always been right. So we have to find our proper place in the continuum. So uh, the, the main point that I wanted to, to speak to though, Sheldon, was you know, when you said that you're part of the hip hop generation and being that I'm older and I can look back now, I've got more experience to look back on now. And I can see where uh, people from my grandparents' generation, my parents' generation and my generation uh, tried to make things better for, uh, they tried to make things better for me. I'm obligated to make things better for, uh, for my children, my grandchildren. But we're dealing in a society and in a world that is trying to undo all of us, right? So what I know from my experiences, particularly growing up, living and growing up in Chicago, that uh, integration was one of the worst things that, that could have ever happened to us. Because with integration, we lost the ability, we lost community. We lost, you know, I grew up in Chicago on the west side of Chicago with a black doctor, black dentist, went to a black bank. I saw black people doing everything everywhere within my space. And so I knew what was possible because I had seen it in my environment. And with integration, we lost all of that. And the most important thing we lost was family, intergenerational family. So now you can move everywhere. So you're now 20, 30 miles from your grandparents. You're, 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 you're maybe the only black, the first black, the second, third black in the community, in your school. So you lose all of those things that, that sustain you, that feed your soul. And one of the things that I've observed by, uh, I would say the, the millennial generation and the generation that has grown up with nothing but digital devices, 
They know the technology, but they don't have a soul. They mm. don't have a soul. They don't, you can't, they can't look you in the eye when they talk to you. They don't have this interpersonal communication because they were not raised by human beings. They were raised by technology. And I should say you work with young people all the time, Dr. Browder, correct? And, and so I'm saying that from my own personal observation. Yeah, yeah. I just want to, so people understood that you weren't being a crotchety, <laughs> older Motown generation person that, you know, I, I know for a fact you work with young people. So I just wanted, you know, people to know. That's the reason why I work with young people because I know what's missing. And, mm. and I see myself as being a bridge, right? I can, you know, most young people have not grown up with their grandparents. I, I, was, I was fortunate in that my mother was 16 years old when I was born, right? So she grew up in her parents' household. I grew up calling my grandparents, uh, my grandparents, mother and father you know because my mother my mother was annie everybody called her annie so i know that what i carry with me today is 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 because of what i got from my grandparents my love of nature uh i learned to to gardening for my grandmother because i used to dig up the garden every spring and help her plant flowers and water the flowers my creativity, my artistic creativity comes from my grandfather. I'm the first one grandson. My grandfather could build anything, could build anything. Even though he had a limited education, he could build anything. And I was his assistant. So I was watching him create things out of nothing. So my creativity comes from my grandfather. So you've got, uh, so, so I know the benefit of growing up in an environment with elders and they pass on their knowledge to you, whether you're conscious of it or not. And most of us, most of us don't realize it until we're much older and we realize mm -hmm. I'm carrying my grandfather's creativity with me so I can take what he had to the next level. So many young people now think that they're out here by themselves. And that's part of the problem of growing up in America. This idea, this falsehood, this lie of rugged individualism. That's a lie. Nobody mm -hmm. in America makes it by themselves. You make nope, it not at all. It's a door for you. Someone stops you. So in terms of the intergenerational transference of knowledge, it only works best when a young person is sitting next to an elder. And that elder pours themselves into you and makes sure that you progress based on them checking and based on a system of checks and balances. And it's only when they certify that you are now prepared to move to the next level that you move to the next level. So this this is what rites of passages were all about. All of that has been destroyed. All of that has been yeah. erased. So we've got all okay. of these souls out here who don't know and don't know that they don't know. So they think that they are everything and they don't have a clue, which means that they are perfect victims for this system that is designed to destroy them. That's what we're up against. Uh, to, to get back to the issue of Adinkra symbols, uh, there is a African physicist at the University of Maryland, right down the street from me, who has studied Adinkra symbols. And he said that Adinkra symbols are actually fractals. And fractals is that next level of, 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 of physics that connects everything to, it's quantum physics, right? And all of that information, and he explains it. You know, I, I don't understand. He's written a couple of books on it. I don't really understand. I'd love to know. But but I know <laughs> there's truth in there. So I've got, a, I, I have some colleagues who, who like explain these concepts with me. And so it gets back to your original question, uh, uh, Sheldon, about the cos, uh, uh, cosmic connection. So that cosmic connection is in everything that African people have done because our consciousness comes from the cosmos. So when I told you when I was out uh, speaking before your Coast Guard group a couple of years ago, uh, when I mentioned that I had found painted on the ceiling of, of, of a 25th dynasty tomb and a 26th dynasty tomb, two tombs that were at least 2,600 years old, I'm the only black person among the group of white archaeologists and Egyptologists. I'm the only one who is, who is African, who is African-centered. And I looked up on the ceiling of these two tools and I saw the Adinkra symbol, all right? I saw the Sankofa Adinkra symbol. So that to me validated the work that Sheikh Andrejump and others were saying, talking about uh, African, the continuity of African culture. And so it, it proved to me that there was a migration of African knowledge from the Nile River Valley to the Niger River Valley. And then ultimately from the Niger River Valley to the Mississippi, to the Potomac, to the Hudson River Valley. So we are part of a continuum. And it's our job to rescue the souls of these young people who don't know who they are. 
and let them know that they are connected to a force, to a power, to a consciousness that is far greater than they, and that they have an obligation to know themselves, not to know those things that your oppressor only wants you to know because right. you'll only be of service to them. But you need to know what you carry in your DNA so that they then become the, the essence of it, whether, whether we truly understand it or not. The essence of it is that we are carrying within our bodies right now, every one of us, 10,000 generations of Africans. And the key is to be able to access that genius on demand. And so there was a process, there's training that you have to go through. That's why you practice. That's why you have discipline. That's why there is an elder who is there to oversee your development so that once they know that you've got it, they can step back and begin training the next young person. And you then go out and you become the hero, right? You, you, you take your culture, you take, you take all of those things that you carry with you out into the world, and then you write a new path, right? So, so that's- That's what, part of the rites of passage and initiation into the adult community, you were saying. To the adult community, into into the junior eldership community, into the eldership community, into the ancestral community, and then to be reborn and the process continues again. So what I'm, what I am at this point in my life, what I am intent on, on putting into the minds of the people who will hear me is the African reality of the Rehemimisu, the repetition of the birth. The African reality that we see reflected in the cosmos and in nature that there is no death. There is this continual rebirth. So if there is no death, when the physical body dies, the soul that animates that physical body is reborn into another physical body and that person's journey continues again. The key is if you can access the memories within that returning soul, then that person becomes what we call in, in today's society, a genius a Stevie Wonder, a Kobe Bryant, a genius. But all that genius has done is to tap into the ancestral memories that they're carrying within them. And they become, they become the hero. So essentially, like your timeline, basically, the two points on the same timeline, right? So it's the timeline when you pet, you transition and the timeline when you come back. And that, that, that's essentially what it is. That, because that's what death is, right? It's a doorway. It's, um, you know, life and death. Yeah, life and death are, are right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, death so is I a have... doorway, and 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 um, who did say Bas and Sekhmet meet you and take you to the great beyond? That's now Valley. That's now Valley spirituality. So, Doctor Bradder, I have a question for you. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, you know, I agree with everything you said, and I think it's really important for us to be, you know, focused on unlocking the knowledge that we have as well as paying attention to the things around us. So I'm gonna ask you a practical application question um, because you know, right now we are be our children are being born into a society where um, we send them to places to have their minds colonized. Mm -hmm. um, last year I ran, my whole focus was decolonizing education. Um, my question to you is for parents who want- Oh, I should mention that Dr. Lawana ran for school board uh, was a president in San Diego. Just and... to be a member of the school board. Oh, okay, yes, yeah. Yeah. And she just, she had 175 votes, 175,000 <laughs> votes cast for her, uh, but she came up just a little sure. short. She needed to find 10,780, one more than what, no, I'm just kidding, that was, a, that, was a Trump, that was an election joke. But yeah, yeah, she, um, <laughs> But yeah, I just want to let you know that she's an educator, Dr. Browder. So I'm sorry, Luana, go ahead, please. All right, so the thing is, um, understanding the context within which we are raising children, um, what are some recommend recommendations you have for parents who want to make sure they inoculate and protect their children? Um, you know, personally, I, I advocate homeschooling. Um, and I've seen it work well, but if homeschooling is not an option, what are some things parents can focus on to make sure they raise children who are, um, who are able to guard their brains from um, infiltration um, of colonized thought? Sure, well, the first thing I would say, we must realize that our culture is our cure. So you cannot be healed in a sick society by immersing yourself 
or wanting to be equal to the greatest purveyors of racism and violence the world has ever known. Who wants to be equal to that? Our culture is our cure. So we must first know who we are. And, and we cannot be dependent on American history to teach us that. So we must study the work of African and African-centered scholars. That's the reason why I started writing books because I didn't learn, I didn't learn about my African heritage until three years after I was out of college. I thought I was smart, I thought I knew a lot. And so when I became a parent, my job was to make sure that I took responsibility for teaching my daughter her African history. That's why I took her to Africa with me when she was seven years old. That's why we wrote her first book when she was eight years old. So that other children who would never travel to Africa could learn about Africa through reading her books. So we've, we've done a series of books by doing that. So what I would tell parents is the first thing you must do is, is have a library. You have a library, you should have a library and the library should, should, contain, should contain books written by and about African people, particularly uh, the history of African people before our enslavement. As, uh, uh, one of the metaphors I use is that um, if the book of African people is a book of a thousand pages, the history of our enslavement begins on page 996 and is only two pages long. We need to know about the first 995 pages. You won't learn that in school. So your home is your first classroom. So every parent has an obligation and a responsibility to raise their children to know and to love who they are as children of African descent. And they should never be ashamed of that. Um, and, and so uh, and as I get older and as I, as, as Sheldon mentioned, I, I work with a lot of young folk and I see the problems that that teenagers and middle school children are bringing to the classroom. And I've also seen that once I can sit down and talk to them about, about what their ancestors have done, it changes their consciousness. And they sit up straight, they want to learn, they want to do more. So um, I say that one of the biggest impediments to the, the growth of our children is technology. They spend too much time on the cell phones, they spend spend too much time uh, watching television, watching music uh, videos, internalizing sound vibration that was designed to destroy them from the inside out. So you have to supplement that. Uh, my, my formula is for every hour you spend um, on a digital device, you should spend an hour reading and discussing what you've read. Families should have time to sit down and read together and have discussions, teach your children how to process information, how to think, teach them their history so that they understand the nature of the world in which they live and that they don't see themselves as victims. And, I, and I'll close on this. Yes. <laughs> if we or when we, as we begin to understand who we are and what we carry with us, no one can stop us. Nothing can stop us, right? And so it's about instilling that knowledge uh, that confidence in our children before you send them out into the world. And even if they go to a school where they're going to be in the minority, as, as I was my last three years of high school uh, in Oak Park, we were the second African-American family to, to live in Oak Park, Illinois. Uh, my three years at Oak Park River Forest High School, there were only two blacks in the entire wow. school with a population of over 3,000. There were no white teachers. Nothing. I was the only black person in all of my class. But the only reason why I was able to survive that was because I had grown up on the west side of Chicago. <laughs> and I could always go back to the west side on the weekend and hang out with my friends. So, so I had something to, to keep me grounded so I didn't lose my community. You, you, still, you still have community. It's family. It's community. Yeah. Exactly. And that's the only thing that matters. We have to rebuild what, what was illegal and what this society uh, does its best to destroy. Dr. Dima, you said, you, you said something uh, very profound. I just I don't want to go past that without reiterating. You were like, uh, you need to have a library in your house. And I, I remember vib vividly being a kid and uh, a guy going door to door and he was selling a um, World Book Encyclopedia. Encyclopedia Britannica. Oh my God. <laughs> and, and my dad had told the story a thousand times how he let the guy go. Like, no, nah, I ain't got the money for it right now. But then something hit him. But when he turned around and he turned back around and went and grabbed the guy from next door, like, okay, I, yep. you know, and, and and those books actually, you know, changed my life because I yeah. had, 
I had that knowledge before I went to get go to the colonization. So I already had. I think you have to be first, too. You know what I mean? I think you have to yeah. teach your kids. You have to be first. You can't be second with the knowledge. You know what I mean? You have to come with and hit them as soon as you can with it so they're prepared when they do step into that other arena. You know what I mean? I, I wanted to just reiterate on okay. that. And, and let me make this point on that point, and then I know Dima wants, Dima's just chomping at the bit. If you all noticed the Bill Cosby show, the Cosby show, which saved NBC in the 1980s, Bill Cosby's show was the first show with black people where you saw a library, where you saw yes. books in the background. The very mm. first television show. Yes. Right. Wow. Yes. <laughs> that wow. show was the first for everything. It was all for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. And I think there, there oh, are so not a lot of... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I know Dima has been wanting to ask the question. Dima. Yeah. <laughs> No, oh, please. I'm 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 absorbing. I I'm, I'll I'll jump in after. Please go ahead. A full oh, I, I was just going to say that you know there are not a lot of opportunities these days for kids to innovate. You know they are taught to memorize and repeat, and they're not encouraged to ask questions, and they're not encouraged to take information and apply it. Um, a lot of public schools, and it's not necessarily the teacher's fault. You know, it is sort of the structure of teaching for the test. And in some instances, um, when teachers do try to innovate, the students just ask, is this gonna be on the test? And they're, they're not interested in learning it because it won't you know, gratify them in, in that they're going to get a good score, or a pat on the head, and then just move right along without ever absorbing information and then having it, an application. And um, you spoke about a library, and I remember growing up, and yeah, I had my media, I had the different forms of media that, you know, I, I took in. I, at the time, it was a, you know, Fisher Price record player and some headphones. <laughs> It's not necessarily an iPad or something that's so immediate, but that is a lot of competition. You know, that's a very engaging form of media. So one thing as a creative that I want to try and do is meet people where they are. I really appreciated my dad because he encouraged me to listen to whatever music it is that I liked, but he also encouraged me to learn and play instruments and no jazz and no classical and you know no rock no soul and know the structure and see the fundamentals between all of them so that when i innovated uh, i was drawing from all the different things that i was exposed to same thing with the library it was like okay well you know i can just look up online and find a recipe but here i have this book in my library foods that harm foods that heal and i can start to look and then check and verify like okay do i feel better after i eat this things that I can kind of research and you know do on my own because I'll speak to students sometimes and they're like well why do I have to know this because I can just look it up on Google and it'll tell me the answer and my response to them is well because Google will tell you what their answer is they'll tell you history but maybe not the story and your truth will be sculpted into something else. Um, and then you won't innovate. You won't change the standard, change the norm. You won't evolve because you're just being told what is. And so uh, I try to, when I speak to um, well, primarily art students and aspiring artists, you know, they're always asking, where do I get my inspiration? Where do you get your inspiration from? How do I become inspired? Um, how do I become a successful artist? And you called it, Dr. Router. It's about the soul. It's about your experience and your observation and what it is that you see and you digest interpret and then reinterpret into the art and you pass it on and the practice and the discipline of honing your craft determines how well you can communicate what it is that you've seen and learned so giving 
kids a chance to take that knowledge and apply it into something tangible and then being able to observe and then be rewarded for their progress and hard work, that, that makes a really big difference because there were times when, when I, I had no place to stay. I was sleeping on a subway or sleeping on a friend's couch. And if I had allowed myself to define myself by my circumstances, then that would have been the end of my story. But in having, even if you're not artistically inclined, so to speak, whatever it is that you can put your focus into and allow yourself to evolve or let the craft evolve through you, it chooses you, (laughs) <laughs> to make it better, then I think you'll find how you can be of service in whatever craft it is that you choose. So, wow. And I will need to interject here because I don't yes, think please. there's any way I can, I can go beyond all the points that have just been <laughs> in this conversation. Please, please. I'm just trying to find where to start because they're literally all connected. But I'll start with what you said in reiterating what Tony said about uh, about the soul, which goes into why spirituality, why African spirituality has been tabooed. That Mm. is the first attack on the African family. That is the first attack on the black family is breaking that continuum because it was, mm. it was trying to control something the colonizers could not see. Our spirituality is connecting to something you can't touch, you can't see, so they can't control it. So it had to be a taboo. Mm. In it being a taboo, then becomes the disconnection. And once it's disconnected, you can feel lost. You must feel lost. You have no other option. Then you don't know that you're an extension of the divine. Then you don't know that you are connected in every single way to everything that is around you, human and non-human. Yes. Then, then you don't have that, that, that confidence in knowing that everything around you has your back, holds you down. Not holds you down as in shackles you, but holds you as in grounds you, as in roots you, as yes. in finds you and connects to you wherever you are on this planet. It will take you back to the mother of all mothers. It will trace you there. And when we say the Nile Valley civilization and the connection to the Nile Valley civilization and whether it's Heru or 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 the the symbols and the signs that's why it's being wiped it's why it's it's egyptology and not nubiology it's why um nubians are just you know they were just the slaves of the egyptian pharaohs who apparently were not black um and it's why we must continue to teach and my first um it wasn't my first my second meeting um with uh with with tony was in was in luxor where he generously invited me to um to the site of excavation and he said a quote there that i have been quoting and re-quoting and i wish i remember who actually said it history is written by the victor but archaeology tells the truth and in 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 saying He was just saying, what did he say? And I had a connection to that because I was just saying it earlier today to my sister. Oh, if you know who you are, if you know where you're coming from, no one can take that away from you. And no one can tell you different. And that's exactly what I was telling my sister this morning because she was so worked up and she was so upset because she went on this 55 minute walk in freezing cold with her dog and it didn't record the workout on her phone. And she's like, I'm so mad. It's like, she said, what who cares what a piece of machine says did or did you know, you, you know you were out there you remember the scale. you pr- you probably have the bruises of when you had to lean on that tree before you hit the ground you know <laughs> no one can take that away from you and that's yeah. how that's something we need to ingrain in our youth 
And in linking that, and I said there are a lot of dots here to connect, it's not just about the teachers. It's not yes. just about the system and and yes. the teaching for tests. It's also right. about the parents who mm. now, who are themselves traumatized, who are themselves yet unhealed, who will feed and project into their children, no questions. That's right. Why can't I do it? Don't ask, because I said so, that's why. And so then, uh, so that's my, my signature now in anything is ask more questions. Because the more questions we ask, whoever we're asking them to, even if no human being is actually responding to us, the ancestors, the universe, our soul will reach back out and come to us with a response whether it's in a song, whether it's in a number, whether it's in a sign, it's in a symbol, whether it's in, a, it's in, in an email connecting you to someone and you end up being on a board of a magnificent organization like Edgo. <laughs> uh, it, you ask the question, sooner or later it's going to come back. But we at, as parents, that's, that would be my recommendation. Let them ask questions. And if you don't know the answer, help them find it, find it together. And to add to one hour technology, one hour reading, one hour out in nature, we are so disconnected yes. with nature. <laughs> the three, they have to be the three. That one hour in nature makes all the difference in the world. I am Nubian. I, I don't even remember the first, the first time I, I went and actually spent time out in nature, yeah, sure, I'd, I'd go horseback riding after school because my school in Egypt was next to the pyramids. So every Thursday after school, we'd go horse riding by the pyramids. Yay, great. Did I know any, Did I know what these pyramids were about? Did I know what the sand I was running on? Nothing. And, you know, I, I go to the U.S. and people are hiking and I was like, why? People are going out to the nature. Yes, yes, but why? Shout out to Black to Nature. If you want to have a nature experience, it's an all black platform connecting black people so that they can go and do things out in nature. So I just want to give them that plug. They were on last week. We were talking about environmental justice. So sorry to interrupt you, Dina. No, no, no. no it no. connects you with what's real. Absolutely. And then connecting us again to healing and understanding. And this is an integral part of Edfu, the work we do at Edfu, it's it's healing that generational trauma of mm. indigenous and African, of people of indigenous and African ancestry. And the, it's multifaceted trauma. There's more than one aspect, but at the core of that trauma is our inability to create because we have been conditioned to believe that we only come from what is war-torn, diseased, and lacking. And yes. we are yet to fully recognize that that was nothing more than projection mm. of the colonizers. They came and projected their lacking. Right. Their, their we, we actually, we actually had this conversation last week. We were saying that, uh, you know, when we were in our natural habitats as indigenous people, we had abundant resources, we but it was people, yeah, yeah. But it was people like Adam Smith who came from areas that had no, had no real resources, came up with theories of, you know, that there was a lack of resources because to us, we could just go outside and get a mango, get an orange, get an apple or something off the tree. We could go fish. We had abundant warmth and sunlight. So to us, we had many resources. So capitalism, which is the book I'm talking about by Adam Smith, right? That he writes that book because of his experience. And his experience is one of lacking of resources. And so that's very true to your point, Dima. That's something that we need to understand is like, we need to teach our systems and our way of life, our indigenous ways, because we are scientists, we're explorers. We are constantly curious and constantly learning. And that is like one of our greatest assets. Um, to speak more about that continuum, it's in our continuum to what our ancestors were and we now are and will continue to be through generations to come, there is a continuum of the psychological warfare that is waged upon our people. 
to break that cycle, to break that, we need to create. Whatever it is we are creating, we need to, that's where depression comes. Depression doesn't come because people are poor or they don't have food. It's because they are unable to create. They are not in the frame, in the space, in, in, well, they're disconnected, so they're not able to create because they're disconnected from the whatever source, right? Is, so. Whoever they're mm -hmm. creating, whether it's art, what, and this is one of the things that I absolutely loved about Africa Week, and 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 I can't wait to see what's com what's going to be coming through this year. Africa Week 2020 was literally the first virtual family reunion of all people of African ancestry, and. Our first reunion was for Africa Liberation Day. It was a week, um, which would not have been possible without Sheldon. It was six days of 24 seven live streaming of all things Africa rising. The amount- I still have flashbacks. <laughs> that's, that's trauma that also needs healing. But, <laughs> but we, well, we did it, we did everything, it. Everything, everything we create everything and it comes to what Tonya was saying he grew up in a space where he saw us do everything we just we need to connect these dogs and so speaking of connecting Dr. Lawana has created a black history cahoots for us so we want to break up the seriousness and have a little fun put his name in and then boom here we go we, we good to go Let's do this. All right, so I'm gonna hit start. And what we got here is, um, so the Afronauts, February 15th quiz. And it's, you get rated on speed too. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so here's the question. The answer is about to pop up right now. So which Hard civil time. rights leader is said to be represented by Professor X of the X-Men comic book series? Some I have one answer so far, too. Oh, that's me? Okay, I'm hitting All it. Right. Um. All right. Okay. All right, so, uh, so three answers registered. It, so the question, of course, is always, before we go to the next question, is it clear how to respond to the quiz on your device? It is. It just took a little while to load. Everybody got that right. It took, I wasn't allowed to, fit, to to work with it because Egyptian internet isn't on my side. Oh. <laughs> uh, that was, that, right, I was so surprised at that. So are you ready for the next one? All right, well, let, let me just ask you, uh, Dr. Lawana, did, did my response come through? This it's is my not going to show me. So when, we, um, when I click next, it's going to show... Um, who answered because it's going to show the standing and it'll show oh, the so I clicked on your screen as opposed to my screen. I should be ah. You should be clicking on your screen. All right. Oh, thank okay. you very much. You got to keep me. So, all right. So, all right. So it's like you have to look on the chat screen to see the question and then. Yeah, um, but I'll also read the, on. I'll read the question out loud while the answers are loading. So you okay. can hear the question too. Thank Is that, you. Will that help? Sure. Oh. Okay. Are y'all ready for the next question? Go. Mm -hmm. Yes. Go on internet. Okay, so right now we've got Agent Afronaut was first, Fu was second, and Kim was third. Uh, well, that's wrong because I answered question one, but it didn't record it. So okay. this game is bogus. This game is. Bogus. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? What is this? What we're what is this? Oh, man. Oh, come <laughs> on. <laughs> That's the symbol that I found on the two Egyptian tombs. Yes. Wow. So did you answer? You see. Yes, I did answer. Oh. This, did this answer. is why Egypt needs another revolution. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's part of how they control your access to knowledge and information. Um, yeah. So um, mm. the, the funny thing about the Sankofa, so that heart symbol is the, is the symbol, I think, less commonly used in some places. A lot of people use the and bird symbol. The bird. Exactly. And so what I do in, um, in organizations, well, specifically Black organizations that I get involved in, I find a way to get the Sankofa bird into their logo so that then they have to have a conversation about the principle of Sankofa when they're explaining who they are. Hey. Excellent. That's All right, excellent. here we go. 
Let's see what we got here. Okay. Oh, it's Ooh, tight. You know, you there. Got I'm going to last one. There. <laughs> <laughs> all right, here we go. <laughs> so, so Dima, we know that you know all the answers, and we're just going to give you credit for having them since <laughs> you're not on your side. I don't know all the answers. You're, 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 the you're leading right now, life. Dina. You're leading. Okay, you're leading. <laughs> I'm a but leader are inside. The, <laughs> so are y'all ready for the next question? Yes, yes. All right. So not all of them are super serious. So then maybe this one might be. OK, this one is a little serious. How many of the 12.5 million African ship in the transatlantic slave went to the US? 6,388,000, 1,000,000, or 10,000,000? Dima, feel free to, to call your answer out since you can. Uh... <laughs> a wild guess. I don't know. Well, we, we know that, that number is wrong. It's more. It was more like fifty million, but um, such is such is life. <laughs> okay, so according to the resource that I found, and it was on the internet, so it's yeah. And the numbers are disputed. I mean, even that number though is much larger than that other Holocaust that everyone will never forget. While they tell us, "Oh, slavery was so long ago, we should just you know." Mm -hmm. um, so according to that, it was 388,000. The reason I picked this question is that, you know, sometimes in the U.S., we forget that before they started shipping Africans to the U.S., they had years of working on the process and figuring out how to perfect it so that really disconnect us. By the time slavery got here, we couldn't have drums, language, fan. They had figured out that they really needed to disconnect us from everything in order to make us effective chattel. Oh man, great point. Just a quick comment on, on the internet, um, on getting sources from the internet, because that's also a point I had yeah. from what Afua was saying, as in, you know, Google will tell you what Google wants to tell you. If right. you ask mm -hmm. Google, the first African country to gain its independence, it'll tell you Ghana. Ghana gained its independence a year after uh, Sudan. Yeah, I was gonna say, that's- <laughs> That's not that's true. Kind of late in the game. Yeah. But you know, Ghana pays quite a bit of money, so it's okay. Right. <laughs> it is. Cash rules everything around me. Well, the US $1 education $1 system is largely run by Texas because they buy the most textbooks. Exactly. But all they also that's where they're printed at is yeah. in Texas. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always tell people in the meeting, if you want to be the secretary or the scribe, you may not realize it, but you have the most power. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. But the word the word secretary itself means a keeper of secrets. Oh, boom. Mm. Wow. Boom. Be and the secretary is always third in line after the president and vice president. Yeah, because they know it all. <laughs> <laughs> they the ones making the secrets. <laughs> all right, here we go. True or false? Judas and the Black Messiah is a story of trust and betrayal during the Black Power Movement. Oh, that's uh, You guys, this isn't even funny. It is not. Not. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. You could be a white okay, supremacist so and get half one. of this, right? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, saw I saw the movie last night. Oh, and what did you think, Dr. Brown? It resonated on so many levels because uh, Fred Hampton uh, was murdered less than a mile from where I live. And I went to uh, college with the sister who was actually in the apartment when they were killed. Oh, wow. So wow. Wow. Uh, was dramatically different from what I read in the Chicago Sun-Times or saw on the news. So that's when I became aware of fake media. Ooh. So, mm. uh, yeah, yeah, great nice. teaching tool. Yeah. So based on what you know, did you think they did a better job than has done in the past of telling the story? Well, um, they, as they said, um, the story was, uh, what, what's the tagline at the beginning of the film? It's based on historical events, right? So it's not right. true because they weren't there for all the intimate conversations that were held. So it's right. an artistic recreation of history just as One Night in Miami was an artistic recreation of a historical fact. Uh, but right. I thought they captured the spirit of these young people. Uh, and that's the thing that impressed me most. Fred Hampton was 21 years old when he was murdered. Yep. To, to um, know that he was bringing Fred, together that's a uh, baby. black folks together white racists on, on the near west side. He was bringing together Hispanics. He was bringing together gang members. Uh, mm. And that um, Jagger Hoover uh, had, to, had to kill him 
and it speaks to the, you know, there's a whole, whole need to be had from that movie uh, because uh, those folk who were in the forefront were killed and the people who survived, uh, we have to question who they were. We need to question who Jesse mm -hmm. Jackson is because of Jesse Thank Jackson's you. role in the murder of, of Martin Luther King. We need to question who Louis Farrakhan is because of his role in the assassination of Martin Luther King. We need to question everything Al Sharpton says. So uh, ask more questions. <laughs> <laughs> now, Dr. Browder, you, you say, Dr. Browder, you say something profound because uh, yesterday uh, Luana had an uh, Afrofuturism dream tank and she talked about something that my good friend Dima always talks about. There are no leaderless ideas. And she was saying how, like, if you have a leader, it's easy for them to be taken out and then um, they're able to change the narrative. Um, and so I think it's important for us as we go forward, learning from history, which you, which you so aptly talked about earlier that we need to do is learning from our history, even our current history, right? Learning from our history and knowing like, yeah, we need to question and like a fool, I think a fool said it as well. Question these leaders, question everything, right? So we need to question these people and understand like, what was your role in this? Like, what is your accountability? Like, why did this go down? And what was you, did you do after the fact, right? So right, I agree that's, with you that. that's exactly how logical thinking works. You <laughs> know as much as there is <laughs> to know, you. you remove the contradictions, and then you repeat what it is that you find, and then you encourage others to come and test your theories. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks. Grammar, so logic, thing, rhetoric. That's how it works. And, and people so, are going to lie. Uh, right. Mr. Jackson has lied continuously. Al Sharpton has lied continuously. Um, it's the race vultures. Their kind lie <laughs> continuously. And right. yeah. have to learn to, the, as, as I said, I don't know who made the quote. It's, it was attributed to some Greek philosopher. But the best trait any person could develop is the judicious sense to know what not to believe. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Critical thinking. Because they'll critical have us thinking. thinking. Critical. That's absolutely vital. No matter what. Because no like, matter what, though. No matter that's right. what. Where it's you not come illegal from, or if it doesn't No matter what, prejudice, to where you, what, what right. tribe you come from, what country you come that's from, right. what religion you come from. Absolutely. You have, that's your, that has to be your basis. Right. You know what I mean? That's right. right. But, but you don't do it out of disrespect. You don't do it out right. of pain. You have to right. be practical. You have to yes. be- Yes, that's the hard part. Uh, well, no, it ain't. No, it's not. <laughs> it's only hard if for you me. don't- For me. You have to be taught how to do it. But brother, you need to learn how to do it. I, you, I, I'm you trying. Know, I, I get better every day. <laughs> you know, you're learning how to do music, right? So you're- No, you're, no, I'm talking about that. You know, me and Sheldon had being a 30 minute- a 30 minute, yeah, I, I get very passionate. We had, we had a 30 minute argument last show, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, and I, from I, the police, yes. Yeah, yeah, you know, and I got terminology, you know, I, terminology. We won't go into that now, though. It's not, it's not wanna... just that, though. It's not just that, sorry, it's not just that, though. Okay. Even if you are questioning in a respectful manner, in a, in a truly, uh, from, from the, the, the point of trying to understand the logic behind things, we, we have to recognize that ego has taken over because spirituality has become tabooed. And once spirituality is mm. out the window, ego is out to play. And once ego is out to play, whatever it is you're questioning <laughs> is an attack on the bubble because oh, there's the bubble phenomenon. Right. People are right. speaking to you from inside their bubble. Whatever mm -hmm. color it is you are spraying out of your mouth at any given point, <laughs> if it's not matching the color inside the bubble, it's going to come and tarnish the bubble. So it is viewed as a potential needle that will pop this bubble and have them floating in the middle of nowhere. It needs to be eliminated. It needs to be taken out. So then it becomes an attack. Then it becomes that you're rude. Then it becomes that you're disrespectful and ungrateful and all of that. And that's why I'm saying parents parents, especially young parents, they need to be aware of the fact that we are still conditioned because our parents have been conditioned to not question authority. And if they're not questioning authority, they've projected that onto you and then you're going in turn projected into your children. And that, that's the cycle we need to break. Question everything. And I don't mean it question it with doubt. I mean question it with curiosity. I mean question it through elders foster these relations where it's okay for me to ask the elders of black movements to say, 
why have you failed us? And I don't mean mm. it as an attack on you, but why, pray tell, can't you sit around the table and put your egos aside? And it's not about the shiny logos and it's not about which organization comes next to what first on the bloody flyer. Let's just have the event here and have this conversation on how to build and move forward without having people's ego so bruised. Thanks. And then come and talk to me about spirituality. <laughs> part of that answer lies in the title of that film judas and the black messiah every organization has been infiltrated by yes. opposition every organization and is 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 dr clark often said um if you go into a meeting with three people distrust two of them <laughs> <laughs> wow wow it's incredibly cynical but Hey. Probably true. Yeah, that's, that that's. I mean, that's, I mean, I I understand. I understand the sentiment totally. I understand the sentiment totally. But man, that's cynical. I hate. I'm a very positive person, so I would really, I would Sheldon, really hate Sheldon to have is, to do that. I, I had to tell y'all, Sheldon is really Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Mugnito tried to call me Pony Boy from uh, oh, well, from, uh from the outside. Yeah, golden, he told me to golden. stay golden. You know what I mean? Come on, come on now. Well, I'm so just I a positive to... person. <laughs> So nothing I have to say, take... There's nothing wrong with being positive, but you also have to be realistic. Ground oh, definitely. Yeah. So he I is. have to say that the thing for me, the takeaway, biggest takeaway from that film was every time you have um, a black leader who starts to bring together other people and not just black people, they mm -hmm. become a greater threat and that's when they get assassinated. Well, that's why COINTELPRO took out Martin Luther King. Yes. Because he wasn't just talking about black liberation. He was talking about, you know, the Vietnam War and how ridiculous it was that the Gulf of Tonkin event, which, you know, I, I, he didn't say that specifically, but it was a false flag. And we were in this other country. Our country was in another country, you know, like shooting people, you know, thousands of miles away for no reason. People were right. dying on both sides. And once he started talking about that, I mean, he was already a threat, you know, organizing people and mobilizing people and inspiring people. And it wasn't just him, you know, from Stokely Carmichael to uh, a lot of people within SNCC and uh, Gloria Richardson. There were just so many people who were lighting all of these fires. Um, but Martin Luther King was a target. And I think and I have to verify this, but I think after it was kind of sort of silently announced that he might be a, a vice presidential running mate. Ooh. Yeah. That made him a target. So you guys ready for the next question? Yes. Yes, yes, indeed. All right. As is, that's also why Martin Luther What is the name of the black woman superhero from the X-Men comic series that can control the weather? Oh, wait, hold on. Where's my... Here we go. <laughs> Wendy Bottoms, huh? <laughs> Wendy Bottoms. <laughs> okay. That just sounds like a fart. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. It's hilarious. Okay. okay. Y'all were scaring me. Okay, let's see what we got here. Who was quickest on the draw? All right, somebody I had to find on. my. <laughs> I had to find yes. my I screen first. Everything. I was like, "Wait, wait!" You know the questions and the answers. I do not know the question. Lawana, do I know the question? <laughs> okay, so here's how it worked. I got questions from them and then added some questions. So Sheldon doesn't know what Mooknito gave me, and Mooknito doesn't know what Sheldon gave me. And I only gave, gave you one question this week. Hey, I'm I only gave. Play. And I only gave one question then this you, week. You shouldn't Sheldon answer should the question playing. that you Sheldon should not be playing. It, my question hasn't come up yet. And you know what? <laughs> Dr. Bada, tell him. Okay. You should so never, you should up, never temper up. down your greatness for other people. Right, Dr. Bada? You should <laughs> never tip. Yes, you, you, like you, you sound like you. Yeah, thank but you, I Dr. Bada. You should never cheat either. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. Thank you. All right, here we go. Who was the black Yay. pioneer trader founder of the settlement that later became Chicago? There's at least two people who should just know this without even having to think. All right, well. And it looks like they already answered. <laughs> oh, that's. Ooh. I'm gonna go with color here. 
All right. Yeah. Everybody that answered got it right. I'm going with color here. That was good. <laughs> the universe uh -oh. led you there. Oh, wait. Where's uh -oh, my AP? Watch out. You, you are in fourth place, Seema. All right, y'all ready? This yep, is the yep. last one. Mm -hmm. All right. This star constellation. All right. This is my question, so I'm not answering. And queen. Hold on this one is... second. Oh, oh, never mind then. Let me see. Uh, I got knocked out of the game. Let me try it now. Okay. Really, really Egypt, really. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's not king and queen. The daughter of an Ethiopian king and queen. Okay. It's... Cassiopeia. Oh, so everybody should get that one then, sister. Yeah, that's a that's a gimme, yo. Okay, that's everybody. And and whose question was that again? Hmm. Actually, the, it, that was my question. I did not answer. I did not answer. So what she got right was it was an Ethiopian queen named Cassiopeia, but her daughter's name was Andromeda. Uh, everybody so I was gonna go for no, well. Okay. No, I, was, so I, again, I was right. gonna go with a guess. I was gonna go with a complete guess, but Egyptian internet once again. That's okay. okay. This was okay. fun and educational. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And of course, listen. I didn't. The last question was the only question I was that was mine, and it's yeah. okay, Sheldon. I didn't. Well, I didn't answer it. Oh, I'm not gonna apologize for being great. Like I like you know what I'm saying? You have to you have to embrace who you are. <laughs> you recognize, right. you recognize who you are, brother. <laughs> <laughs>